So welcome everybody to the Thursday afternoon session. Um, and we have two more talks for the afternoon before heading off to a, a very pleasant dinner. Uh, and our first talk is by uh, Dieter Lust, whose title you can see. Okay, Emil, thanks a lot. And let me say before I start, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. So many thanks for the kind invitation. It's great here to be together to learn something which is also somehow new to me. I mean, I'm not a big expert on uh, microstates. And therefore, as you will see, my talk is not really related to microstates so much. Maybe I will uh, mention it in one or a uh, few words, but uh, my talk is related on some other issue, which I think uh, people uh, discuss a lot during these days, namely the swampland. So it's about uh, black holes and the swampland. In fact, um, my talk is based on some paper. It's a, I think, nice Italian German collaboration with Nicolo Cribiori, Marco Stirigel, Alessandra Necki, and Marco Scalisi. But uh, there's also previous work together with people who are, I think, known here in the Paris area, Quentin Bonfoy, Luca Ciambelli, and uh, Severin List. All right, so that's the outline of my talk. I will first introduce the Swampland program uh, in the nutshell for those of you who are not so familiar with it. Uh, then I like to comment on uh, temperature and distance because temperature will play a role in my talk. I will uh, then go through various uh, types of black holes, Schwarzschild black hole, Reisel Nordstrom black hole, Dilatonic black hole, and uh, N equals two non-extremal non black hole. And finally, and that is some work in progress, I, lo I like to talk about the correspondence between uh, certain black hole solutions, domain walls, and uh, kind of standard flux compactifications, which are important for ADS or even uh, the Zitter vacuum in string theory. So what is a swampland? Uh, in short, it addresses the question which infrared consistent effective field theory cannot be embedded into a UV complete quantum gravity theory. So if you find such an effective field theory, and there are many of them, which do not, allow, do not allow for an uplift into quantum gravity or into, or into string theory, you doom them to be in the swampland. So here's a picture by Eran Palti, which I think is now well known. Um, in the uh, UV, there's quantum gravity or string theory. And then if you go down in energy, if you do compactification, you obtain a vast landscape of string compactifications or string solutions, but they are surrounded by even more vast um, um, theory space, uh, which cannot be embedded in the string theory, and that's called the swampland. In fact, black holes play an important role in the swampland program. Basically, the, the black holes, or certain considerations about black holes, were the starting point of uh, famous swampland conjectures. So in particular, the weak gravity conjecture, namely, uh, how black holes can or cannot uh, decay uh, leads to the weak gravity conjecture. That's not so much about, it's not so much what I will uh, discuss today, uh, but today in this talk, I like to address the question is certain limits in the parameter spaces of black holes themselves belong to the swampland and signal a breakdown of the effective field theory. So this may say, sound a little bit strange to you, I mean, black holes are well established and they are part of uh, quantum gravity. But uh, as I will discuss in certain limits in the parameter space, they might also, or they can also possibly or likely belong to the swampland. So how this can be, uh, there is one swampland conjecture, which I will mainly use. This is a swampland distance conjecture. And it says that at large distances delta in the parameter space of string vacua there must be an infinite tower of states uh, which are associated with a certain mass scale, little m. So uh, it means, more concretely, there's a tower of states uh, with an associated mass scale m, and these masses scale exponentially with e to the minus delta. So if delta becomes large, if some certain uh, direction or some certain limit in the parameter space, uh, becomes far away from the interior of the modelized space, these states, their masses, these towers become lighter and lighter. Or in other words, the effective field theory breaks down at the 
typical mass scale of this uh, tower. So this provides you a cutoff scale lambda swamp land. And uh, obviously, uh, lambda swamp land becomes much smaller than the Planck mass when uh, this distance delta becomes large. And uh, therefore, the effective feed theory can only be valid below this swampland decoupling scale, but above we, we have to change the picture or simply the effective feed theory is not any more valid. There's one more condition, which is perhaps not mentioned so often, this is a called of decoupling condition, because this is a gravity or quantum gravity effect. We want that this effect goes away when we send the Planck scale, the Planck length to zero. So there's a, another condition that M should basically scale the negative power of LP so that M the scale decouples when we turn off gravity effects. And this will be also become a little bit important later on. Moreover, these swampland arguments mostly apply not uh, in pure gravity or in pure quantum gravity, but uh, mostly when coupling gravity to additional matter fields. Okay, so you, you might ask now, what are these towers which become massless? And as it was argued by uh, Lee, Lerche and uh, Weigand, there can be only two relevant towers in string theory. This is called emergent string conjecture. I mean, first of all, the towers arise if we, so to say, go to some decompactification limit. Then the tower of states is given by the so-called KK particles. And uh, indeed, uh, the masses of the KK particles, they scale uh, inverse the radius of the volume of, of the compactification. So if the radius becomes large, these KK particles become lighter and lighter. Or in a T-dual picture, also the winding states can serve in the tower and uh, the winding masses are then proportional to this radius. Therefore, you can read off a related uh, distance in the internal modular space and you see immediately that the distance, the related distance, uh, goes with the log of the R and indeed for small R and also large R, large radii, this distance becomes large. So it fits precisely the expectation of the swampland distance conjecture. The second case of uh, swampland states are the, the string excitations or the string itself. I think therefore it's also called the emergent string conjecture. Uh, the massive string excitations, they scale uh, with the uh, appropriate string coupling constant times square root of n, the so-called mode number. And you see here that for large or small string coupling, these masses also become small. They collapse. And therefore, there's an associated distance, which again is given by the log of the string coupling constant. It becomes large or small in the weak or also in the strong coupling limit if there's also a strong weak coupling symmetry or so-called S-duality symmetry. So these are the only two instances people have argued where this swamp and distance conjecture becomes relevant. So the, one of the relevant swamp and parameters as we just have uh, seen is the geometrical uh, radius uh, or the string uh, coupling constant. Um, so now let me come to the uh, black hole distance uh, conjecture, which we have uh, um, spelled out uh, together with these people. And there we have proposed that the black hole entropy S uh, should also serve as a swampland parameter. Or in other words, in the limit of large, and this is what we discussed in this paper, we mainly discussed the limit of large uh, entropy. In the limit of large black hole entropy, there should be also, this should be at infinite distance in the black hole parameter space. And it should be also accompanied by a tower of mass states. So there should be also a distance or a distance functional, which uh, is proportional to log S times some parameter. And the tower masses then would scale to polynomial with S to some uh, negative power minus lambda. So that's the conjecture. And uh, of course, the, the task is to see whether it can hold or in what kind of circumstances this can be true or not true. In fact, we now we want to go one step further. We want to extend the discussion also to a non-extremal uh, charged black holes, which possess also non-vanishing temperature. So we will deal with uh, black holes that have two basic parameters, the entropy S 
and also the temperature T. And again, we uh, like to look at some interesting limits, namely large and small black holes with large or small entropy or tem temperature. And uh, this might be also at the end relevant for Hawking radiation or for, for microstates maybe. Okay. There are also some other interesting papers which discuss similar problems like a recent one by Hamada Montero, Arfa and Valenzuela, and also an older paper by uh, Holzer and Wilczek. They discuss also some potential problems which go along with uh, particular uh, small uh, black holes. Good. So uh, once again, we want to know if the temperature or the entropy are relevant from the parameters and uh, if they are related to certain distance in the black hole parameter space in the black hole moduli space. So let's call this delta S and delta T. And we like to ask what is happening in the limits where either S or T or both become large or small and whether these related distances also become uh, large in these limits. And of course, most importantly, the question is the related tower of light states on the black hole horizon. We will see that these states uh, will live on the black hole horizon in these limits. And uh, again, uh, also, if there are kind of dualities uh, between, say, even the large entropy and the small entropy limit or the large temperature and the small temperature limit. Okay. So uh, after this introduction, I like first to come to uh, what, how, we, how we deal with temperature and quantum field theory or with gravity. Um, the first case is just flat space, uh, space time. Uh, where we put time on a Euclidean uh, circle. I think this is very well known. Then temperature is just given by the inverse radius of this time circle. So H bar over beta, uh, or which is the same as H bar over two pi times the radius in the time direction. And indeed, formally there is a tower of states. In this case, they are called the Matsubara modes with some frequencies uh, which uh, precisely scale, scale like one over beta. So these uh, Matsubara frequencies are proportional to the temperature. And uh, it was also uh, discussed that there could be also possible thermal winding modes, which uh, scale with the inverse temperature. So from this simple observation, we could even say that there uh, is a possible temperature distance, which also go like, goes like a log of the temperature, uh, because these Matsubara modes uh, become uh, uh, light, say, in the limit of uh, small temperature. So formally, you can uh, say that there's this temperature distance, which is proportional to the absolute value of log uh, the Planck length over x bar times the temperature. Uh, we can now extend this to, uh, to relativity. So uh, the next uh, example, say, is Rindler space with some acceleration parameter a, this is a very well known uh, 4D uh, here in four dimension, four dimension metric. So the acceleration parameter uh, in this uh, uh, coordinate, in this Rindler coordinates, appears here. And what I called Matsubara, or uh, uh, what uh, uh, I, the temperature now is called the so called Unruh temperature. And this is proportional to the acceleration parameter A. And there's a so called Unruh frequency, which is now replacing the Matsubara fre frequency. And again, the UNRU frequency is just given uh, by A is proportional to A. However, um, as a remark, this omega U, this UNRU frequency does not satisfy the swamp and decoupling condition. You see that the end, all the Planck mass there. So in the limit of decoupling, this frequency does not uh, uh, disappear, does not become uh, large. And uh, therefore, there is no reason uh, to call this UNRU temperature really a swamp land parameter because uh, it would not lead to an inconsistent effective field theory. So there is no gravity effect uh, involved here. So it's only a formal, formal observation for the moment. Okay, so then uh, let's do the next step. And uh, now let's go really to uh, GR and study various cases for, uh, for black holes. So, the first black hole, which is the oldest one, uh, as you know, is the Schwarzschild black hole. It is characterized by one parameter. So it's a one parameter family of uh, geometries, uh, of uh, metrics. Uh, it has this uh, well-known Schwarzschild form with this uh, 
um, function f of r, which contains uh, the mass in the uh, familiar form. Uh, there's the horizon, which is proportional to the mass. There's the surface gravity, which is one over the uh, size of the horizon. And we have the Bekenstein Hawking entropy uh, that goes in four dimensions like m square or the same like uh, the Schwarzschild radius square times uh, relevant factors of the Planck length in h bar. And finally, we have also the Hawking temperature T, which is proportional to one over M. So it's just given by uh, the uh, uh, surface gravity. So I think these are all very familiar formulas. Okay, so these are the, uh, this is the Schwarzschild black hole. And in fact, for the Schwarzschild black hole, you, you see immediately that the entropy and the temperature, they are not independent parameters. They are related. Uh, and uh, they satisfy the condition that S times T squared is one half. So this is the so-called, call it the Schwarzschild uh, hyperbola. The relevant modes are now the Hawking modes. Uh, the Hawking frequencies are again proportional to the temperature T or expressed in terms of the mass. They go like one over M times one over LP square. And uh, now you see that, for example, in particular in the limit of large black holes where you send T to zero or S to infinity, uh, the Hawking modes uh, indeed become massless and also the swampland decoupling condition is satisfied. So now, so to say for the first time, we can uh, formulate a swampland conjecture which involves a temperature, namely there's a temperature distance functional, at least formally, which uh, um, gives the right scaling behavior with respect to the Hawking modes uh, because they become light in these limits. So expressed in terms of T, it goes like log T or in terms of S, it goes like log uh, times one over square root of S and the uh, uh, Hawking modes in the limit of large entropy or small temperature uh, become light. Okay, uh, in fact, this distance agrees with the so-called De Witt distance in this space of Schwarzschild metrics. So you can, this is, I think, a neat calculation. You can apply this uh, um, distance formula and compute the distance with respect to the mass of the black hole. This is a so uh, including uh, the one over the volume factor. And what you get uh, after some not so difficult calculation that it goes like log of the mass. So it precisely reproduce, reproduces what I have said before. If you now put instead of the mass, either the temperature or, or the entropy. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, the other week, we had an interesting discussion also in the defense of uh, He was also uh, presenting various distances uh, in, his, uh, in his work. And uh, I think it's still an interesting question which of the various distances should be applied. But I think here in this context of Swampland, it is uh, the David distance, which gives uh, the correct or uh, useful answers. And uh, we did before uh, a similar calculation with Eran Palti in Kumun Wafa, uh, which then led to the so-called ADS <laughs> distance conjecture. So, of course, now the question is, what is the role of the Hawking modes for the swampland? Does the 2D effective feed on the horizon break down in the limit of small temperature or large entropy? Or, and if uh, possibly, if there's even new tower of states in the li limit of large temperature and small entropy, so in other words, for small black holes. Okay, I think this, the answer to this question is, uh, is really, uh, not, uh, not, uh, not clear from the very beginning. And um, in the previous work with, uh, with these authors, we have in fact investigated the possibility that the tower of states is related basically the, to the energy differences of black hole microstates. So this is the only time where I mentioned black hole microstates in, uh, in my talk. Is in, in particular in some picture which was developed by Bali and uh, Gomez, in which we also investigate in this paper, these differences uh, are related uh, to so-called Goldstone bosons of broken BMS symmetries. And if you apply these uh, arguments, you can indeed see that the masses of these Goldstone bosons, they scale with some power of the entropy. Uh, so they go 
uh, they become uh, very light in the limit of large entropy. So these Goldstone bosons, which live on the horizon, are one possible candidate also for the tower of states, which I have uh, introduced at the beginning. But still, I think uh, it is not clear if the black hole microstates really respectively these Goldstone bosons can, plow, can play the role of the Swampland Tower of States and signal the, uh, a breakdown of the effective field theory. So this would also go somehow against uh, the so-called emergent string conjecture, which I have mentioned in the beginning that there can be only KK modes or string excitations serving as this tower. So therefore, I like to go uh, uh, into a little bit different uh, direction. I want to, in a way, abandon this idea. Also, I think it's still worth to be further investigated, the relation to the microstructures. So I, in the following, uh, I want to couple holes uh, to physical scalar fields. And I want to couple them in particular to the Dilaton string theory or to the volume modulus of some compactification. So in other words, I have to consider uh, generalized solutions uh, which uh, are coupled to scalar fields in gravity or in supergravity. And uh, then indeed uh, the idea is or the aim is to relate uh, the parameters S and T temperature and entropy and their corresponding distances to the more established distances with respect to the scalar field modelized space, namely with respect to the dilaton and with respect to the volume. And uh, then whenever delta phi or V, where V is the volume, becomes large, then indeed the swampland distance conjecture predicts a breakdown uh, now of the full 4D effective field theory due to the emergence of either light string states or KK or winding modes. Okay, let's, um, let's uh, try to investigate this. And um, the next step in that direction uh, is uh, to uh, consider uh, the uh, Reisner Nordstrom charged black hole. Now we uh, consider a two parameter family of black holes, namely the two parameters are now the mass uh, and the charges of the Reisner Nordstrom black holes. Uh, here is symmetric, I think it's also uh, familiar here, where M, the mass, and Q appear in this a particular way. Uh, the uh, entropy is given by the size of the outer horizon, uh, whereas the temperature, again, is given by the surface gravity, but it's given by this uh, particular combination of parameters. It goes like one over M plus C square, where C is a so-called extremality parameter, namely C is, a, is given by the square root of M square minus Q square, or expressed in terms of uh, entropy and temperature, it is just given by the product S times T. And the Hawking modes again uh, scale like the temperature. So what we, we see here that uh, clearly we have now two independent parameters, it's a two family of uh, space time. You can use, uh, you can take as parameters the mass or the charge, but you can also take alternatively as the two independent parameters, the entropy and the, the temperature. And that is what we will want to do in the following. We want to consider the black hole configuration space uh, in the so-called uh, ST plane, in the temperature entropy plane, and uh, the allowed region of sensible black hole solutions is this uh, bluish region here. It has two boundaries where either S is zero or T is zero, and then there's another boundary that is a so-called Schwarzschild line where uh, we are in this Schwarzschild hyperbola where S times T square is a constant. Outside, uh, formally, we can also look at the outside region, but there the, uh, the mass, the, the charge is uh, imaginary. So Q square is uh, smaller than zero. And in fact, we have also two extremality lines uh, because the extremality parameter was, uh, parameter was given by S times T. Um, if you wish, this is a standard extremal line where the temperature is zero, but uh, it's also true that the limit of vanishing entropy uh, provides extremal uh, black holes. This is perhaps not so familiar. Of course, these black holes are a little bit more problematic because they have small or even zero uh, uh, entropy. Uh, so we have these two extremality lines, T1 and uh, T2. T2, as I just said, is a standard extremality line where 
the mass is the mass m square is equal to uh, q square. This region is the region of small black holes, and uh, the upper region then is the region of uh, large black holes with large masses and uh, charges. Okay. Again, we can briefly do the same exercise and compute the De Witt metric uh, for this two parameter space of uh, geometries. And it can be also done. And uh, it's given by this kind of integral. So again, there's this logarithmic dependence in T and in S and becomes large for large or small temperatures and entropy. And uh, if you look at this formula, it raises another question, in my opinion, because you see here that uh, the swamp and distance conjecture would now also predict uh, a breakdown of the effective heat theory for extreme black holes where, with vanishing temperature, because this, this term will also become large. And this is also a little bit obscure, I believe, and maybe even not uh, true that extreme black holes are, so to say, infinite distance away from uh, non extreme ones, and uh, something that should happen in this limit. Uh, we were just thinking about it, and I think it's not completely resolved, but I think this limit, uh, what is happening. Uh, an infinite throat is forming uh, precisely of the AD2 times S2 geometry of the extreme black hole. And uh, perhaps then this form the distance conjecture should not be anymore the one which one should uh, use here. So are, where in your considerations is, are things like the, um, uh, the correspondence transition that we heard about yesterday? Where, I mean, if the black hole gets small enough in string theory, you expect it to... Yes merge with some continuum of string or uh, it's a very good question so I, I i in a way i'm i'm blind to this so i basically i treat the parameter space of the black hole all the way down to the small black hole limit where the entropy is small however as you correctly say at some point one has to take into account stringy corrections or higher curvature corrections and the, then the black hole will turn into a string and we have this uh, correspondence transition so oh, this is not captured here. So uh, this is so to say one caveat, one has to say this is not captured here. And this transition between a black hole and a string is not, uh, not, uh, not discussed here. So in other words, uh, what I say here is more trustable in the large black hole limit where the entropy is big than in the small uh, entropy limit. Okay. Okay. So maybe one, one indeed should keep this in mind. So, that was the rise of Nordstrom black hole. And now, as I said, I want to couple it to scalar fields. The first case uh, I, I will treat very briefly that the so-called dilatonic black hole, which I think was uh, uh, first discussed by Svetic and Hume or maybe, maybe other people. Um, and uh, you see, so this, this is a black hole which carries uh, electric charge Q, but it carry also, can carry also magnetic charge P and uh, so to say it's stabilized by these two charges. The entropy is given by the product of P times Q. And now it has also a trivial dilaton profile, phi is the dilaton. The dilaton profile is given uh, by, determined by the ratio of Q over P and it's a horizon. It's just given by uh, this particular ratio. So if you wish, we can consider two, two, two cases. Either we, we keep Q fixed, and then look at the large entropy limit. So we, we let the P grow, and then uh, the, uh, uh, the dilaton uh, uh, becomes uh, large in this limit, or we do the opposite, we keep P fixed, and again do the uh, uh, large entropy limit, and then you see that the dilaton I goes to minus infinity. But either way, what you do, uh, it's a large distance limit in the dilaton configuration space in the scalar field space, so indeed the infinite uh, or possibly also the zero entropy limit are at infinite distance in the scalar field space and now lead to a tower of masses state which are precisely or should be precisely the string states. And in fact, as you can see here, in this simple example, the cases A and B are so-called S uh, dual to each other. So if you um, exchange the magnetic black hole, magnetic dilatonic black hole with the electric one and vice versa, basically we change the electric frame is a magnetic frame, and uh, what is uh, precisely uh, that is precisely captured by by S duality. So this is a simple warm up uh, uh, example, which uh, already shows I think some of the uh, interesting physics. And now I want to uh, Richard 
And um, I think this is uh, bec become a little bit more closer, I think, now to, um, uh, to uh, fastballs and microstates because the black hole configuration, which I now will use, uh, I think precisely or similar to the type, I think, which are discussed also here in the workshop. Okay, to be precise, I want to consider n equal to multi charged and multi scalar black holes in four dimensions. And the starting point is here the so called n equals two prepotential f of x, where x are the so called, uh, they correspond to the so called vector multiplets uh, effective for the uh, supergravity Lagrangian. So um, very often uh, this prepotential. Uh, is uh, cubic in the relevant fields with some coupling matrices Dijk, which correspond to the intersection uh, matrices, uh, color, uh, geometrical color uh, picture. Uh, for example, if one considers type 2 ape compactification on a torus or on a Calabiao threefold, there are corresponding scalar fields Zi, which are given by uh, the projective ratio of Xi over X0. So in the Calabiao case, this index little i runs from one to uh, h11 uh, to the Hodge number h11. And then there are also h11 plus one u1 gauge fields, which we label by the letter capital F uh, lambda. I will mostly use the simple example, the so-called STU model which is in, indeed has a cubic prepotential x1 times x2 times x3 over x0. And uh, again, in the Calabiao case, you can immediately read off the volume of the six dimensional space. The volume is given by the product of the three scalar fields, uh, which is nothing else than the product S times T times uh, U, if I call it scalar fields, S, uh, T, and U. And basically they are measuring volumes of associated two or four cycles in the, in the Calabiao space. So the, the KK modes now, they go like uh, one over V uh, uh, to the sixth power, to the sixth power. In the case, if they are winding modes, they scale like the volume with the power one over six, I think measured in, in string units. Okay, so these are, is the Calabiao volume and this is uh, the associated tower masses for the KK modes and the winding modes. Uh, next, we want to uh, construct uh, non-extremal black holes in this uh, supergravity framework. And uh, I like to emphasize that we are not only considering extreme black holes, I think familiar and equal to, but there's also uh, um, a way to get non-extreme black holes in this uh, closed and uh, exact non-extreme black hole solutions. And the one which uh, we will consider, you could also generalize this, have four non-vanishing charges, one electric charge Q0, and three magnetic charges P1, P2, and uh, P3. And again, I always like to uh, provide this geometric uh, picture. They will precisely correspond in type 2A to a D0, D4, D4, D4 uh, brain, brain system. And I will come back to it also later on. So this is... Uh, um, the kind of famous D0, D4, D4, D4 system, and it corresponds also to the D1, D5, D5, I think, wave uh, setup in uh, type 2B, which was considered before by Strominger, Waffa, and, uh, and other people. So, as I said, one can write down fully the extreme metric. Uh, it's given here. So, T is the time coordinate, rho is the uh, radial coordinate, and here is the angular part, and there are certain functions appearing. Uh, a kind of a warp function e to the minus to u, to uh, u, and it depends on rho in this way. C is again the extremality parameter, which will be again s times t entropy times uh, times temperature, and uh, there's another function which we call u e, um, which is given by the product of uh, three more functions i1, i2, i3. So you see, you need you need several of these kind of harmonic functions. Uh, what is uh, uh, important at the end of the day, it is these functions I0 and AI, which contain the information of the black hole charges. So you see here Q0, and here you see the PI, not very largely, and they contain also some other parameters, which we call L0 and uh, MI, which basically uh, give you 
the asymptotic value of the black hole at spatial infinity. So uh, this is all encoded in this, uh, in this ansatz and it fully solves the uh, supergravity non-extremal field equation. Uh, so you see that the three scalars S, T and U, they run indeed from spatial infinity to the values at the horizon. The horizon is chosen to be at minus infinity and uh, the scalar fields are precisely given by the ratios, by these particular ratios of these functions. So knowing these functions, you can also read off the radial dependence and also the asymptotic values of the scalar fields. Okay, so what is the entropy? So you see also uh, the A0 and B0 appearing here, depending on the sign of these expressions here. So the entropy, I mean, the details are perhaps not so important, but uh, it's also possible then uh, to write down uh, the full expressions for the entropy. So the entropy is given by, by this product here times C square. And uh, the temperature uh, is uh, given by the inverse expression. And there's a one over C here. And what you can also do, that is also nice and also important, you can also express the volume of the internal space by the same functions. And it's given by this expression here. So you, can, you have in full closed form the entropy, the temperature, and also the volume uh, at the horizon where the volume is given in terms of the scalar field. The known extremal limit is obtained for C equal to zero. And for C equal to zero, you see that the temperature becomes zero, but the limit is taken such that the entropy stays finite. And then the entropy takes its well-known value. It's given by the product of this, uh, the square root of the product of these uh, four charges. I think this is a known result. And uh, also the volume uh, on the horizon, the Calabi-Yau volume on the horizon is given by this expression, which again is determined only in charges. So you see that uh, uh, for the extreme black hole, the dependence on the initial values at spatial infinity, they are completely washed out. They're uh, due to the uh, uh, so-called N equals two attractor mechanism which is not true anymore, non-extreme black hole, okay? But for the extreme one, uh, the information on the horizon uh, is, uh, uh, the information at infinity is not anymore, does not appear anymore in the horizon, okay? But uh, as I said, we want to consider the non-extreme case because we want to uh, have two parameters, namely the entropy and the temperature. Uh, so I again want to consider two kinds of solutions which are again, if you wish, uh, dual to each other. And the first uh, of the solutions is we keep Q0 fact fixed. So we dial one particular value for Q0, it might be a big value or a small number. And uh, now we want uh, to vary the magnetic charges Pi. You can do this. And if you go back to these formulas, the nice thing is now you can express all the charges uh, in terms of the volume and, uh, and the, so you can eliminate the charges. It depends on the charges and you can re-express it in terms of the volume and the entropy. So what you get, uh, you get a, a closed expression of the volume now of the calabi volume in terms of the entropy S and in terms of the temperature T. And what appears here is the Q0 because we have uh, predetermined it and also the volume uh, at uh, spatial infinity also appears here as a parameter in this relation. Okay, so this is the uh, between the calabi volume and uh, the entropy and the temperature for fixed uh, electric charge Q0. And now it is not so difficult to consider uh, in particular the large uh, entropy limit uh, namely where S goes to zero. And at the same time, we also uh, take uh, T, excuse me, where, where S becomes large, where S goes to infinity. And at the same time, uh, we uh, consider also the small temperature limit. And you see that in this limit, indeed, uh, what is going to happen is that the KK masses, they become very heavy. They scale like T to the minus one third, but the winding states become light uh, and uh, they would uh, therefore uh, serve as being the uh, tower of states, which we can now uh, safely uh, identify with the state of the Swapland uh, conjecture. And you know, uh, and you also see that these limits 
uh, are again independent from the initial values, spatial infinity. Of course, you could also take the opposite limit uh, Emil was worried about and correctly worried about, namely the small entropy limit and the large temperature limit, but say we are brave and we are still doing it. And then you, you see that just the opposite is happening in this limit. The KK modes uh, become light and the winding modes uh, become uh, heavy. So in either case, um, this uh, swampland states. So we see uh, that uh, these in these two limits, these two limits indeed lead to towers of massless states uh, located at the black hole horizon and these limits in the internal modelized space. Also to say, if you wish the ingredients of the swampland distance conjecture are uh, satisfied and we would have to conclude or we conclude that the effective field theory at least of the horizon breaks down because we have these uh, additional massless fields living at the black hole horizon. So again, I can, show, I can show you this in this diagram. So here is the uh, large temperature, small entropy uh, regime. Here is the large entropy and small temperature regime. And you see what is happening in this regime. The winding modes become light and the KK modes become heavy. And in this regime, the winding modes become heavy and the KK modes uh, become light. For note, I did not uh, show it here, did not, uh, but it can be also easily worked out. You can ask yourself, uh, what is then happening if you go along uh, along this direction? We keep the entropy fixed, but uh, lower the temperature, go to the extreme limit. And uh, in this limit, we see that there's no massless tower of states. So this would not be a swampland limit. And this is also what I mentioned before, that in this limit, the David distance sum seemingly gives a kind of misleading answer because from uh, distance functional, um, you would uh, conclude that this uh, limit is also at infinite distance, but uh, we see here from this analysis, there are no associated tower of states. Okay. Um, if you're even more brave, you can also now uh, conjecture that there are dualities between the large and the small temperature and entropy inherited from T duality in the internal compact space. So you can read of that there's a certain duality, which changes T, the temperature with the inverse temperature in this way, and the entropy with the inverse entropy uh, in this way, uh, which is entirely due to the exchange between the Kaluza Klein modes and the Weinem modes in the internal space. So um, the exchange of small with large black hole maps, uh, the internal KK modes in the winding states onto each other. Uh, very briefly, you could also do, do the opposite uh, case where we, uh, where we uh, if you wish the dual case, where we uh, keep the PIs fixed and just vary the Q0. And uh, then the relation between the volume, the entropy and the temperature is as such. So only PI appears here because we keep it as a starting value. And uh, again, the boundary parameters appear also. And then the, the, then the picture is precisely the opposite. In the large entropy limit and temperature limit, now the KK modes become light and the winding modes become heavy uh, and, uh, and vice versa. So you see that also these two cases are in a way uh, dual to each other. They also involve uh, uh, exchange between the winding modes and the KK modes. Okay, so this is just the opposite situation compared to the A-type black hole. Good, so this basically finishes my, my uh, swampland discussion. I don't know how much time do I still have, maybe five or 10 minutes. Okay, even better. So I think basically this, uh, this ends my, my swampland discussion. And what I want to uh, discuss at the end is some work in progress also with these uh, collaborators. Uh, it is about, uh, I think very, yes. story yes. what you said it was formal but what should i make of it i mean the, the fact that i have this uh, i i think one should not make too much out of it frankly <laughs> <laughs> but why i mean i, I was just uh, bringing this um, to show you that um, temperature is not always a good i mean this large or small temperature sure. limit should not always to be taken uh, as a limit where the effective field theory breaks down something is happening in this limit formally 
but uh, you no, you do not always get the massless tower of states in the sense of uh, the quantum gravity swampland. The, the other comment I'll just make is, it seems like this might be a general phenomenon, what you were talking about before, in the sense of, if you have an infinite horizon area in the space time, then some cycle in the internal space should be <laughs> blowing down or blowing up. That's correct. Is it, that, I mean, that's a nice, what you've done is a nice illustration of that, but I think, is, is there some much more general theorem that might be buried in supergravity somewhere? I, I believe so, yes. Uh, so here we have seen it on the basis of this uh, examples, um, relatively simply, but I think complicated enough that you can also investigate the non-extremal uh, cases. But I think this is precisely what is happening. The internal uh, space or the sizes of internal cycles is uh, linked to the uh, horizon size of a black hole uh, in, in space. The map is not completely one-to-one. -one. I mean, you can also consider some uh, certain scaling limits where you, you both scale the electric and the magnetic charges. And then this phenomenon is not uh, happening, but um, if you keep the electric charge or the magnetic charge fixed, then it's precisely as you say. And I think this should be a general for, uh, phenomenon, which we can also investigate in more generality for more complicated Calabi-Yau space, maybe also taking into account uh, um, instant non-corrections, which go beyond the cubic prepotential and, and so on. Uh, maybe th some of these phenomena then are even uh, be, uh, can be, so to say, uh, dissolved uh, or cured by, by uh, higher order corrections. It's maybe also a possibility which, which could happen. Good, so in the last uh, uh, part of my talk, I want to now uh, discuss uh, some correspondence between black holes, domain walls, and uh, flux compactification. So this is work in progress. Uh, actually, I think this is not, um, in my opinion, not completely new. There are, there are previous papers, but in a way, it's also a little bit not really forgotten. But uh, uh, I think it gives them a very nice uh, angle, also a uh, point of view on what I said before, uh, drawing a parallelism between black holes, which are characterized by certain electric and mag magnetic charges, and the uh, flux compactifications, which are characterized by uh, internal uh, flux charges in some internal spaces. So let me just recap the black hole picture. I just want to reformulate a little bit what I said before. Uh, it is, there's a very nice formalism which works uh, in particular for extremely black holes, but I think it also works for non-extremal ones. Uh, I think I, here for simplicity, I, I discussed the extremal case. So we can start in NEQ2 with the so-called central charge, uh, Z, which is uh, given by the sum of the period vectors x lambda and f lambda uh, uh, calabi yau space, say, or in n equals two supergravity. So this is the, the central charge um, of uh, uh, in, in n equals two, um, multiplied by e to the k half, where k is the scalar potential. And from that one can, com can construct immediately a so-called black hole potential, v black hole, which is the sum of the dz square, where d is the scalar invariant derivative with respect to the scalar fields plus d square. So this is a familiar expression. There are some uh, ZUSI BPS conditions. So the black hole is uh, BPS or supersymmetric when uh, DZ is equal to zero. So when this condition uh, is satisfied and uh, I have mentioned also the attractor mechanism, uh, we can now uh, use the extremization property uh, of this uh, black hole potential. So we can consider it's a stationary points of the black hole potential with respect to the scalar fields. And the stationary points of the black hole potential uh, are, is just the entropy uh, of the corresponding black hole. So that's a very nice formalism to uh, get the entropy for extremal black holes. They can be BPS or, or even non-BPS, uh, depending whether DZ uh, is zero. And uh, as you know, these black holes can be also viewed as interpolating solution between Minkowski uh, at infinity and uh, the ADS two times S2 geometry on the black hole horizon. So this is in a nutshell, uh, a very uh, economic and nice way to get the end of two black holes, at least the extreme ones, BPS on BPS. So I, I show you again my, my favorite example it is the type 2A with the D0, D4, D4, D4 brain system. Uh, they are uh, point-like in the four space-time dimensions. So the, the size are the four dimensional coordinates 
and the axes are the internal coordinates. And you see how the brains are located, uh, which build the black hole. They're wrapped around uh, certain four cycles in the internal space, and uh, the, the, they are located such that the, the BPS conditions or the, uh, excuse me, the, the extremal conditions are satisfied. This example is precisely the cubic prepotential, which I have discussed before. And you can now, so let's consider the most simple case of one Kähler modulus, which I call Z, which is X1 over X0, as a real part and imaginary part, and the central charge in terms of the charge Q and the charge, electric charge Q and the magnetic charge P of the black hole and the scalar field Y, which is the imaginary part of the Z as this form. Uh, the black hole potential can be also immediately derived and uh, it can be extremized. And then you indeed get the result, which I basically shown before, that the entropy, which is a stationary point of this potential, is given by the square root of Q times uh, P cube. And in fact, you can also show uh, that they are supersymmetric and non supersymmetric ADS2 times S2, extremely depending on the signs of P and Q. So this entropy formula allows for non zero, non uh, uh, BPS and BPS solutions. Uh, actually, when the sign of Q and the sign of P agrees, then the BPS condition is satisfied. And DZ is zero. However, when the sign of P and Q are different from each other, then the BPS condition is not satisfied. So both uh, uh, BPS and non BPS solutions are possible. So what we will now do in the next step, you see the brain configuration here. Uh, we will add uh, two more dimensions to the brains. And in fact, we, we will add uh, two more brain dimensions, not in the internal space. We will leave everything the same in the internal space, but we will add them in space time. So what we will get, we will not get any more point-like objects. We will get uh, co-dimension one objects, which are nothing else than domain walls. So with the same kind of setup, you can now consider domain solutions. And the domain walls are now solutions that interpolate really between ADS4 and Minkowski in four dimensions. Dimension, again, is given by the same central charge. And uh, you can also follow the scale of the dependence and so on. I do not show it here. Um, this is very similar to the black hole solution. Now in the last step, uh, I come to the flux picture. And in the flux picture, I take these domain walls and I replace them by the fluxes, which are precisely sourced by those brains. So you, you, you take these brains and you know that there are some corresponding fluxes, which are the sources of these brains. And uh, these fluxes are precisely the fluxes uh, which uh, appear uh, in the ADS, uh, in the context of ADS flux compactifications. So what one does formally in the supergravity formalism, one replaces the uh, central charge Z by the superpotential, formally the superpotential has precisely the same form than the uh, central charge Z before. But uh, supergravity scalar potential by some reason, which I also could explain you, changes a little bit of form. It's uh, again given by dW square, but in the black hole or domain wall case, there was a plus Z square and the plus z square is now turning into a minus 3w square in the effective supergravity action. Uh, the Zuzi condition are unchanged. And again, we can extremize this supergravity potential now. And the extrema are not, are now, uh, not anymore called entropy, but they're precisely uh, the uh, cosmological constant, namely the, uh, the value of the vacuum energy. So this is nothing else. At the minimum of the potential, we get the lambda CC, which is a V supergravity. So let's do the same uh, example in type 2A as before. One needs also some other ingredients because in the, uh, in the real world, Calabriao, we have also other model I, which has to be stabilized. I do not consider them like, uh, like uh, complex structure model I. But in any case, we can compute the supergravity potential. Now the P and the Qs are flux uh, values of the corresponding, uh, I think, zero and four fluxes here, which source these brains. And the lambda CC is given by this expression. It's again given by the same combination, Q times uh, P cube. Now with a minus sign in front of. Uh, and you see, in this case, there's only one supersymmetric ADS4 vacuum. Because of the uh, uh, polynomial structure, the non-supersymmetric um, uh, extremum um, is not anymore there. There's no solution uh, 
with uh, dw equal to zero. And then there's also only the supersymmetric ADS4 vacuum. So you, so you see uh, that the positive entropy is now traded into a negative cosmological constant by doing this uh, black hole domain wall flux uh, correspondence. And one can also consider other examples with Nibel Schwartz five brains and KK model, uh, KK monopoles in order to stabilize additional uh, moduli. Let me also say that I think this uh, brain domain wall flux setup was also used in a uh, interesting paper uh, recently and was also uh, with uh, D5 and NS5 brains in this case, and was also relevant for holographic description uh, for the uh, LT uh, scenario. I think these also precisely use the same kind of uh, flux uh, domain wall uh, correspondence I'm, uh, I'm discussing here. So let me, at the end, then just uh, recap. We can compare the black holes in the flux vacuum. For the black holes, we have the central charge Z. For the uh, fluxes, we have the super potential. We have the black hole potential here, and we have the supergravity potential there. And they are the same kind of extremization attractor condition. Uh, now we can also understand even better their related distance conjectures in the various, because distance conjectures we also discussed before in the limit where the cosmological constant goes to zero and they are in, in a way now one to one. The distance conjectures we discussed now with respect to the entropy. And you could also go, uh, go on and this is also what we consider now. We can investigate the properties of the uh, potentials. For example, uh, for, the exam, for the case I have studied, there's this kind of uh, uh, general property, the uh, black hole potential is satisfying. Um, uh, and uh, if you analyze this, uh, it will tell you uh, that there can be only extrema uh, with, uh, with positive uh, value. And this makes, of course, perfect sense because the entropy is known to be a positive number. If you uh, analyze the same kind of um, uh, conditions on the supergravity potential, so this is something uh, which is really reminiscent of the V prime over V condition of uh, Barfield R that it satisfies this. And if you analyze this, you see that the corresponding supergravity potential only allows uh, neg uh, extra, this, uh, negative cosmologic. So in this case, which is in a way admittedly rather simple, you, you, you also understand um, uh, why um, the supergravity potential only allow for ADS minima, which are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the positive entropy uh, solutions uh, for the black holes. Okay, so I think that's uh, basically what I wanted to say. Let me summarize very briefly. Uh, we have studied non-extremal charged black holes with infinite or zero entropy, respectively zero or infinite temperature. And these are at infinite distance in the black hole moduli space. We couple them to additional scalar fields. And then this infinite distance limit can often lead to a tower of masses physical fields on the black hole horizon and uh, therefore are problematic from the swampland distance point of view. Um, in particular, again, coming back to Emmett's question, in particular, the small extreme of black holes with vanishing entropy uh, uh, and constant uh, temperature. Um, yeah, uh, those also lead to a massless tower of state. Uh, they are problematic, but uh, I agree one should consider also stringy or other type of corrections to understand them completely. Uh, we have also seen some interesting thermodynamic dualities between small and large black holes. Uh, we have seen a close relation between the black hole swamp and conjectures in the flux landscape. And therefore, at the end, because this is a microstate conference, I like also again pose the question what is the relation between the, these light towers of swamp land states, uh, which we have clearly identified, uh, and on the black hole horizon, and uh, on the other hand, uh, the black hole microstates. So I think this is open for discussion and I'd like to thank you. Questions? Joseph. So I had a question about this massless states. So the way you get these massless states in the, in, in, in the swamp land limit, um, is it by, by collapsing the internal dimensions? Is, is the torus collapsing? Or yes, the torus is collapsing, or some of the cycles of the torus is collapsing precisely. Mm -hmm. I see. Or, or, or becoming large, either way. Mm -hmm. Yes, I see. That's precisely what is happening. Mm -hmm. 
I see, I see. And the distance, so, so you're saying that the distance in modular space, okay, I'm a bit confused because on one hand, I'm making the throw longer. Well, we, we know already, I think, um, we, we can assume that in the limit where some cycle is collapsing, um, or if the volume becomes large, uh, we know already from previous work that this uh, limit is infinite distance in the internal mm -hmm. modular space. Mm -hmm. But in principle, the black hole is still there and the entropy should still be there. I mean, in principle, you know, even if the cycle becomes small, I mean, okay, there'll be some string effects, you know, so what? You know, yes, I mean, still, yes, I agree. Therefore, so I the number of states it, it, should be- A particular picture in the limit where the entropy becomes small, and I really should uh, repeat this, uh, has to be taken, uh, corrections has to be taken account. I think the picture is, uh, is safe in the limit of large entropy, but uh, uh, we need uh, to understand corrections in the small entropy limit. What about the, the the zero temperature, you know, BPS limit? That's in some sense you were finding infinite distances there. I mean, physically you kind of expect some kind of infinite distance because the unattainability of zero temperature, all sorts of black hole thermodynamics arguments saying you can never get a black hole and make it extremal. So infinite distance makes sense from that perspective, but not from the Swampland conjecture. Yes. So how do I reconcile that? I, I completely agree. Uh, infinite distance on the one hand uh, shows up also if I use this uh, so-called De Witt uh, uh, distance functional. And uh, I think the, uh, the distance in this case also can be understood geometrically. The ADS2 times S2 uh, geometry is evolving. So it, uh, from the geometrical point of view, indeed it uh, uh, looks like being an infinite distance. However, as you just say, uh, from the swampland internal modelized point of view, nothing uh, really is, is happening in this limit. Um, therefore, indeed, it gives you a little bit uh, of a worry um, whether this uh, functional should be on uh, last Thursday. It, it could be that one should refine um, the distance functional to use some other distance, which also captures uh, this, but uh, I cannot give you a full answer. So there's, there's still a kind of a ambiguity here in the game. So you, you sometimes, I mean, it, it sounds a little bit uh, silly. Uh, you take something which gives a useful answer, which makes sense, and you, you still uh, um, think about something which does not fit the, at least the swamp temperature. Other questions? All right, if not, let's uh, thank Peter again.